Welcome everyone. Good morning. We're going to get started. I'm Nicole Young and I'm one of the co-hosts of these uh, core coffee chats. And I'm joined by my co-host Nicole Lezen and together we're the local consultants who facilitate a countywide initiative called the Collective of Results and Evidence-Based Investments or CORE. And it's a collective impact approach to achieving equitable health and well-being for all people across the lifespan in Santa Cruz County. Our core events are held bilingually in English with Spanish interpretation. And today we're able to do that thanks to our team, Jorge Valenzuela, who's interpreting, and Gisela Carrasco, who is interpreting right now and will also be translating the chats. So again, hopefully some of you know uh, by now that again, CORE stands for the Collective of Results and Evidence-Based Investments. It's both a funding model and a movement to achieve equitable health and well-being in Santa Cruz County using a results-based collective impact approach that's responsive to community needs. And it has on the next slide, you'll see this mi mission and vision with equity at the center and a recurring theme in all the work that we do. Next slide. And when we say equitable health and well-being, we mean that all people across the lifespan have equitable opportunities to experience these eight interconnected, interdependent core conditions for health and well-being, and that people's opportunities and life outcomes aren't predict predictable for better or for worse by things like race, ethnicity, income level, gender identity, or other social identities. And again, equity is at the center of this diagram, just to remind us and to illustrate the point that we have to constantly examine and address our individual, organizational, and systemic beliefs and practices and structures that often are the very cause of what perpetuates the inequities that we're trying to eliminate. And so next slide, you'll see that the core coffee chats and events like this are offered as part of what we call the Core Institute for Innovation and Impact. And so just think of the Core Institute as kind of a container for you know, an array of trainings and technical assistance, informational sessions like this, learning opportunities for a variety of people in nonprofits, the public sector, grassroots organizations, uh, and even the business community. We sometimes have um, visitors from the business community drop in on these to really try to build shared knowledge and skills and, and uh, build the kinds of systems we need to fulfill that collective vision of an equitable, thriving, resilient community. And so now I'm going to turn it over to Nicole Lezen to give us an overview of our topic today, Targeted Universalism. Thanks, Nicole, and welcome all of you. I see in the chat that we have curiosity about targeted universalism. Some of you may have some exposure to this already, and you may even have heard it in a recent core coffee chat. We'll go over that in just a moment. But whether it's new to you or something you're already familiar with or something you're interested in exploring more, we hope today will be an overview so that we can start using some of these terms and concepts together, but also a way to explore what we can do locally to apply some of these concepts. So the picture that you see here is John A. Powell, and he is the director of the Othering and Belonging Institute at UC Berkeley. He's the person who originally developed both the concept and the phrase targeted universalism. Nicole and I have had a chance to hear him at various collective impact conferences. And if you ever get a chance to do so, he's an amazing person, an amazing speaker. And we're gonna show you a quick clip, just a, a few minutes of him speaking so you'll get a sense of that but don't ever pass up a chance to hear John Powell when you're, when you're at a conference. Um, so it's really appropriate, we think, that he heads the Othering and Belonging Institute, because in a lot of ways, that's what targeted universalism is really about. It asks us to focus on populations that have been othered in various ways, and by focusing on them, to bring them into a sense of belonging. So as his definition says, it's an approach that supports the needs of the particular, while reminding us that we're all part of the same social fabric. So we hope an hour from now, you'll have a much better sense of what that means. So let's show a quick clip of him. And hopefully this, all this technology will work and you'll be able to hear him, but let us know if you can't. We started in much of the world with extreme inequality, but in many of our societies, in many of our lives, we moved to a concept of equality. 
In the last 15, 20 years, we realized that equality uh, is not enough. People are not situated the same. You don't treat someone who is sighted and someone who's not sighted the same. That's maybe equality, but it's not equity. So we move to equity. In our practice of equity, oftentimes we just focus on the disparities, not realizing that even the group who's at the top of the disparities is not necessarily getting what that group deserves or needs. At the Elderly Belong Institute and beyond, we started talking about targeted universalism. The universal is not just simply what the dominant group has, but it's what all of us deserves. But we're not situated the same. So in order for us to get what we all deserve, we have to be targeted. So now we're in a belonging frame. We're going to move to an imagined future where we all belong, in which we all move together and create belonging on Earth and each other, where we learn to care about each other, love each other, see each other, without becoming each other. We have to actually not just think about people, we have to think about structures. It's calling for something new. So I hope you got a sense of his... We started in much of the sorry, world. His style and his sense of talking about these concepts of equity in terms of othering and belonging. And there's some pieces of that that we'll bring forward. And again, this is really an overview. There's so much great density to this work and to these concepts. And we'll put links in the chat, um, as Gisela just did, to the Othering and Belonging Institute, where you can find a lot more resources about this if this sparks your interest. But just as an overview, some of the key concepts behind targeted universalism are that it's much more than just a combination of targeted policies and universal policies. So in, before we get into that, let's talk about what those are in particular. So a targeted policy, as you see on this table, could be a policy that singles out a specific group, usually with some kind of elig eligibility criteria like an income threshold. So for example, families eligible for the Supplemental Nutrition and Assistance Program, or SNAP, have to meet a particular income requirement. And so targeted policies don't have a universal goal. So in this case, it doesn't say everyone should have enough nutritious food to meet their needs. It's trying very specifically to help by targeting one group and even the group with the greatest needs, but it's not saying anything about whether anyone else is having their needs met. It can still help a lot of people so it's not a critique of targeted policies necessarily, it's just that they don't help everyone and they're not designed to. And so when John Powell in that clip mentioned, um, it's not about what the dominant group has or doesn't have, people in a dominant group may also not be having their needs met. So, it's, so that's where he believes targeted policies fall short. Universal policies do aspire to serve everyone, so for example, universal health care has universal in its name and the Affordable Care Act was thought of this way as extending universal health care coverage. It had a universal goal, a goal that everyone should have health care coverage, but we know in practice that's not what happened. First of all, some people were left out. So for example, people who were undocumented, others were left out because they couldn't afford the premiums and even if they gained coverage, that didn't necessarily translate into access to care. Targeted universal policies are like what John A. Powell described, different strategies based on different needs of different groups, while also setting a goal for the general population so that everyone benefits. That universal goal really sets this apart. He often uses the example of home ownership rates. We can try to increase homeownership rates for a group with the lowest rates of homeownership while also saying that homeownership rates are low in our community overall and in fact are getting lower and more out of reach for all. So helping a group with different needs and strategies attain a goal while also reaching for an ambitious universal goal takes policy discussions out of the scarcity mindset that's so familiar to many of us and it just interrupts those discussions about who deserves what and the zero sum game of one group's gain is another one's loss. 
So when you delve into targeted universalism and its materials, there's a helpful five-step process for achieving targeted universalism. And I'm gonna go over each step and then we'll talk about how those apply to different situations in our county. So the first step is to establish a universal goal. And as we mentioned, that's really what sets this apart from other kinds of policies. So we're gonna use an example throughout this just to illustrate each of these steps. And again, there's a lot, lot, lot more to this when you, when you dig in, but this is just to give you an overview of how this could work. So for an example, let's say we wanted to have a universal goal of 100% proficiency in eighth grade math. That is definitely aspirational. It recognizes that many jobs and careers could open up to students with more math proficiency. So it's linked to other universal goals or core conditions like economic self-sufficiency. The next step is to assess the general population's performance relative to that universal goal. So in our example, let's say we find that 80% of eighth graders in our county are proficient in math, which would actually be really great, um, but it's not 100%, which is our universal goal. So we're still talking about the population as a whole in step two. In step three, we realize that's not the end of the story. So if you're familiar with some of our previous core coffee chats about the results menu and data share, this is where you start digging deeper and looking at disaggregated data. So you might find, for example, again, this is a hypothetical example, you might find that the average proficiency of 80% overall masks the fact that Latinx eighth graders are actually below that at 70%. So what do you do with that? In step four, you wanna understand why that is. And as John A. Powell said in that video clip, this is where we really start to ask about the structures. What are the system-wide issues? What are the structures that are either supporting some differences or impeding groups from attaining that universal goal. So in this step, we think about what, what could be happening here that explains that difference. Maybe the classroom instruction and materials are getting in the way. Maybe some specific tutoring at an earlier grade would close this gap. So whatever it is, we can go to step five and develop and implement targeted strategies. So in this example, let's say it's English as a second language specific math tutoring for Latinx students. But the beauty of targeted universalism is what happens when we do that. Maybe we discover that other students whose first language is not English benefit from the same type of tutoring. Maybe teachers change the way that they explain a concept so it's understood better, not only by students who are English language learners in Spanish or another language, but by many other students who are struggling with math for other reasons. So again, the potential and the beauty of targeted universalism, to quote John A. Powell one more time, is that we support the needs of the particular while strengthening the social fabric for all. So at this point, these are still abstract steps and examples, but we were very fortunate in a recent core coffee conversation about racial equity work within county agencies that was followed a week later by a similar conversation with representatives from local nonprofits to have heard an example from Valerie Thompson, the assistant chief probation officer at Santa Cruz County Probation, talking about a very local example of targeted universalism. So in case you weren't at that talk, I'm just gonna quickly recap some of what she said with her slides. And if you weren't able to attend those conversations but would like to view them or even revisit them, that like all of our core coffee chats and conversations, they're available on the core YouTube channel in English and Spanish. So Valerie shared with us how she and her colleagues at the probation department looked at some data comparing juvenile probation demographics, as you see here, and she also talked about some similar data for, for adults. But just to focus on the juvenile probation demographics for a moment, she and her colleagues asked themselves constantly, how are people in our county showing up in the system and what can we learn about some of these differences and how to address them? So they look at the ethnicity and gender, 
but also at the type of um, whether it's a felony or a misdemeanor that's engaging people with the system. And they keep wondering, what are the needs of young people and their families in these situations? What can we do differently to change these statistics? And so I'll just mention in both the school eighth grade math proficiency example, we just went over hypothetically and this one and many others, this is an opportunity to look at qualitative data as well as quantitative data and statistics. So this is where, as the probation department did, you might be conducting some group discussions with youth and their families or some individual interviews and really trying to learn what is missing here. So these, um, these conversations really led to a lot of investigation about things like new placement orders. So these are um, a trend in out of home placements for Latinx youth and the population overall by asking youth and families what kinds of services they needed, what was missing for them. The probation department was able to work with its partners at the County Office of Education, at PVUSD, Community Action Board and others to really focus on a more social emotional approach to the services because they learned that that was a huge gap for this population. And so this is what targeted universalism does in practice. By focusing on the social emotional needs of the Latinx population in juvenile probation, all of the out-of-home placements went down. Just as in our previous example, when we had the schools focusing on a particular type of intervention for math proficiency, it helped the targeted population, but it helped all students. And that's targeted universalism in a nutshell. You focus on the needs of the particular and strengthen the outcomes for everyone. So we're very curious about how this lands with you. And we would like to open up the discussion to hear from you in the chat, or you could raise your hand. Um, let us know if there are other local examples of what we've described as targeted universalism that you're aware of, either in practice or something that might be a potential application of this. Maybe you want to ask or talk about how you see the relationship between targeted universalism and some of the equity discussions we've been having. What, what resonates for you about those connections? How can we all think about targeted in different ways to close disparities gaps and create more shared goals. And if we have a follow-up session on this to go a little deeper, are there particular topics or aspects of this that you'd like to explore together? So we're going to open this up to all of you. And please feel free to chime in. And again, we, we are all in learning mode with this and trying to really understand um, some potential applications of this in our county. So don't be shy. I'm not seeing any hands up or chats yet. I'm ever hopeful. Maybe we can take one question at a time on from the slide, because um, I'd be curious to hear from others um, based on what you heard Nicole describing. Does anything, does that sound like anything you're doing and made you realize, oh, yes, we intentionally or <laughs> perhaps without even realizing it, have been doing something along the lines of targeted universalism? I have a possible example. Great. I'm not, I'm not sure, so bear with me. But um, there's a program called CPSP, which is Comprehensive Perinatal Services Programs. And it's only for Medi-Cal folks. Um, and they have it at Santa Cruz Community Health Centers and Salude, where I work. Um, but it really focuses on like all of the needs that pregnant women and their families have. So everything from social, emotional, to housing, to food insecurity. Um, and it's only for the Medi-Cal population. But because we do that work, we have all of those resources now, and, and it's also on everybody's mind who works in the prenatal programs. So even though it's not specifically geared towards people who don't have Medi-Cal, 
everybody who is pregnant is benefiting from it because the resources are there and they're what we're kind of focusing on and thinking about. I'm not sure if that's an example, but that's, there's my two cents. Yeah, Jay, that's a great example. And, and actually the stress of parenthood um, is, a, is such a good example of something that can, that people can experience at so many different income levels and in so many different ways. And those supports can be just so life-changing for multiple generations in a family. So um, it's a, it's very similar to that SNAP example of a targeted policy that has a lot more potential, um, but has an income threshold for this particular um, option. And then I see um, Dennis had a question in the chat about ways to address the typical conservative pushback on individual responsibility. That's also a huge framing challenge. Um, so Dennis, thanks for bringing that up. That's actually something that if you get into some of the uh, materials on targeted universalism is a particular interest of John Powell's and a particular strength of this approach because he really goes out of his way to make the point that just because somebody is in the dominant culture, so in this case for, for um, let's say for, for white people in our, in our um, society, that doesn't mean that they wouldn't benefit from these types of policies and from supports. And so he really talks about the limits of individual um, responsibility so that so many things are parts of systems and structures and again, to use some of the examples we've just had of, of early parenthood, of home ownership, of struggling in school. So those are, are all areas where just because there's a disparity doesn't mean that the mainstream group that a, that a conservative uh, political operative might be worried about is, is doing well. It means that everybody can, can uh, benefit. So he, he gets into that a lot in terms of the the way that you talk about who deserves help, um, who, who benefits, the this, this zero-sum game idea that if one group gets a benefit or help that, the, that it comes at the expense of another group, he really tries to get away from all that and talk about how these structures and systems affect all of us. I think that's a, a huge strength of this approach. And Kirsten, I see that you've got a comment in the chat about um, youth bike safety training in schools and learning that students in lower income areas didn't have bikes. So then you have a second grade walk safety program offered countywide, ensuring that all youth have skills to navigate today's more risky streets as pedestrians. So that's a great example of expanding where you thought a need was and trying to, um, to use that concept of safety and safety in your neighborhood whether you're on two wheels or two feet. So thanks for that example. I think you guys have this. <laughs> yep, I think uh, one example um, in uh, human services is in our um, child welfare system in our system improvement plan, one of the strategies is to improve father engagement um, and so kind of picking out that particular subpopulation uh, while also uh, realizing that those strategies that could be used for fathers could be used with parents in general um, when, when serving them and their at-risk children. Absolutely, George. Thanks for that. Another great example. And, and a group that's often overlooked and, and maybe um, assumed to be more privileged in some ways than, than might be the case. So great example. Other ideas about either how this is currently being applied or could be? This might be one of those things where once you learn about it and start looking for it, you start seeing it in more and more places. It just has a different name. And yes, Dennis, the framing is critical. Um, so recognizing systemic and interconnected nature of issues rather than individ individuality of our world. Couldn't agree more. And that's part of why, you know, just the core framework that Nicole went over earlier really does try to both, you know, connect across the core conditions and look at equity through a systems lens. So we are, we very much um, 
try to bring that forward and think about it when we're analyzing the ways to use data and information and potential change. So even if you're not hearing the term targeted universalism, for example, when using disaggregated data or trying to figure out what an intervention might be at a system or structural level, that's really behind it. I, I personally, the more I read about targeted universalism and listen to John Powell clips and so forth, it just, it has such a, a beautiful simplicity to it, but that doesn't mean that it's simple. No, it's just really got a, a lot of really profound um, implications and depths, I think. So appreciate all of your interest in this. What other kinds of questions would you have if we were to, to do a follow-up or, or maybe um, incorporate this in some way to future Core Institute events? What are you curious about this? I guess I have a question, um, which is the examples that we're talking about are things that were not necessarily done for everybody, but they were done for these specific targeted groups like we talked about, and then they benefit everybody else. So how do we be intentional from the beginning and not just have examples that are mm -hmm. that are post <laughs> post program? Yeah. Um, but how do we like start out from that perspective? Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. Instead of it having being a happy byproduct or accident to have it more baked in to program designs and evaluation as well. So tr really trying to track that the way the probation department did and others have. Great question. And Kirsten's offering uh, trying to and an interest in seeing other data points of successful applications of this and supporting enrolling others and applying the strategy in our projects. Great. So we, we will invite you as you go about your busy days, if you think of examples in your own work or things you're coming across with colleagues, um, to let us know. We'd we'll be very, very happy to share more local examples in a future Core Coffee Chat. And if anyone's listening to this recorded and wasn't able to be here live, of course, that invitation extends to you as well. One thing that stood out for me, Nicole, as you were walking through those five steps is like, I can think of examples of kind of initiatives or collaboratives that have done things like trying to set universal goals or community-wide goals. You know, there's a lot of focus and attention and skill being developed around disaggregating data. Um, I think what stood out for me was oftentimes those efforts feel separate, like <laughs> there's a community-wide goal, but then like how to really see it through, like through those five steps. Um, which I think could get to what Jade was expressing interest in earlier in terms of how to really um, kind of develop that habit, that, that muscle to kind of approach planning uh, collaboration in this way versus realizing afterwards, oh, great, we happened <laughs> to do something yeah. that resembles targeted universalism. And um, I guess I would be curious, is that something that Others of you have, have experienced as well, or feel like that's kind of a missing link in terms of how to really connect collaborative efforts to identify community-wide goals with the disaggregated data, with the targeted strategies. And is that an area of interest to learn more? And I see George's comment in the chat 
or question or area of interest, how do we apply targeted universalism within other efforts such as results-based accountability and other equity frameworks? And I think one thing that I'd be interested in, in seeing too is, um, you know, when we're talking about disaggregated, disaggregated data, especially in, in Santa Cruz, some of our um, populations are pretty relatively small. And so thinking about how do you apply this when some of those groups are so small that it's hard to have big takeaways on, on differences that you're seeing. So for, you know, for example, the African American community is relatively small and uh, Santa Cruz, but we know they have you know disparate impacts from from different things. But then, how do you use something like targeted universalism to really understand what outcomes and if they are you know uh, different than other groups? Yeah, that's a great point, George. Because so sometimes disaggregating the data can have the opposite effect. Hi, this is Dennis Hungrich uh, here. Uh, perhaps one of the ways to think about that is to consider expanding the, uh, the frame to uh, neighboring counties. Uh, I'm thinking particularly Monterey County and, and maybe San Benito County. Um, since that increases the service population, one could make some uh, educated assumptions about the impact uh, with a larger number that way. Yeah, that's a great point, Dennis. And there are some data sets that really lend themselves to that. Emily, did you have a comment? Your, your tile lit up. It may just be an artifact of something. No, I was just trying, you know, I was still just thinking it through around mm -hmm. um, building capacity to disaggregate data to yeah. be able to look at things in this way. Yes. Um, and how do we do that? Because um, I think we're still learning how to do this and recognizing that if something, like you said, 80% looks great on the surface, but disaggregating it to see, is it great for everyone? Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, Emily, so on data share, you know, we're, we're making a big effort to, to try to disaggregate as much data as we can that's available through that mechanism. And then, you know, some, sometimes it is, and sometimes it isn't. Um, sometimes it's not collected that way, um, or if it is collected, it's harder to get at. And that particular example that the Othering and Belonging Institute uses of eighth grade math proficiency is one of the Santa Cruz data factoids that's not disaggregated on data share at the moment. So we're, we're hoping that over time, more and more of that will be available that way. But you're right, it's you hit some limitations pretty quickly, both in terms of the data that are available, and then our ability to use the data in, in these ways. But we're working on it. Nicole, did you see Helen's comment in the chat? Yeah, let me take a quick look there. I'm not a good multitasker, I apologize. <laughs> So Helen, um, CAB's community action planning process is deeply engaged in looking at inequities and in resources and outcomes focused on our Latinx, undocumented and indigenous populations. Funding and resources are needed to close these gaps and promote greater equity and technical assistance or TA to support organizations in having this lens, absolutely. And that's another thing, you know, we're, we're aware that there is local work uh, being done. And so data share is one way to try to share some of those um, explorations and discoveries, um, even when they're not in a formal data set. Um, and, and there's a lot of value in different types of data, as I mentioned earlier, both qualitative and quantitative um, from multiple sources. So thanks for reminding us of that, Helen. One other thought, if I may, uh, this is Dennis. Uh, um, since data is a, uh, data are uh, lagging indicators, um, uh, moving the discussion up to the upfront, uh, 
Um, it seems to be that we have enough anecdotal and, and specific data out in the world to make the presumption that uh, some, an approach like targeted universalism will be useful. We get to change our mindsets about uh, how we deal with people. Um, I teach at CSUMB and uh, making allowance online for the fact that not everybody has access to equipment that works well all the time and or all the other barriers that might be in the way. And to make that part of the discussion explicitly and changing the mindset of service providers um, around these ideas that there's probably uh, disparate impact that's probably true and building into upfront the approaches to take that into consideration. How do we talk to the, how do we data, uh, how do we uh, uh, level the room, so to speak, uh, when we deliver services? We make that part of the upfront discussion. Thank you, Dennis. You're right, we don't, we don't have to wait often for the, the data, but the data help make certain kinds of cases, as you mentioned earlier about the, um, the different ways of looking at investing in, in changing systems and structures. But it's definitely an approach that can be used in the design and phase as well as implementation and after the fact. Well, just while we're still pondering some of these implications and local examples, I just wanted to share this um, image of the a sort of targeted universalism um, monograph that was released within the last couple of years. So a lot of the things that we covered in today's um, core coffee chat are listed here with some of the examples that'll feel familiar to you when you look at them, but a lot more um, context for them than we were able to present today. So if this is something you want to learn more about, this is a great starting point. And it's also got a, a bibliography for additional reading. Um, you, can, you can see the image there that's familiar from the clip. Um, there are longer clips on the Othering and Belonging website. Um, and there are tutorials and all kinds of things. So this really was just an overview for those of you who might have wanted to learn a little more or see if see if that this was something you wanted to explore. But um, we hope that this whets your appetite for thinking about this in different ways locally, but also um, for learning more about it together. So we would definitely follow up with additional chats in the future. Any other reflections or comments on, on this? We might have a first ever chat ending early, but we'll let you know about some other things that are coming up. So Nicole? Thanks. So we have a full schedule planned for October. Um, and we've got a couple of the registration links that are up and active. So next week we are taking a break um, and actually on September 28th, that will be the day that uh, the Human Services Department and City of Santa Cruz will be making presentations on the recommended funding framework for the core investments request for proposals um, to the Board of Supervisors and the City, of, and the city Council. So, we know we're going to want to listen into that uh, and want to encourage others to do that as well. And so we're going to take a break next Tuesday and we'll be back on October 5th to start off Domestic Violence Awareness Month with, with a presentation and discussion on local trends and responses uh, with Monarch Services and Walnut Avenue Family and Women's Center. Uh, the following week, we're going to have a panel with uh, Pajaro Valley Prevention Student Assistance and some local pediatricians talking about COVID vaccines for kids and the anticipated upcoming uh, authorization to start giving vaccines to kids younger than 12 years old. So that will be a, a really informative session. And then we're gonna have a, a topic focused on learning about efforts that have happened to launch a local guaranteed income pilot project from Santa Cruz Community Ventures. And we'll hear about their program, ALAS. 
And then later in the month, an update on the Unitas platform for making closed loop referrals. Um, it's been active now in our community for a few months. And, uh, and uh, so we'll hear more about that and encourage other people to sign on and start using it. And then, as some of you know, we're getting ready to uh, for the anticipated release of the, again, core request for proposals. So starting in November, December, we'll have a full schedule of training and technical assistance available to support that process. Um, so stay tuned for several more updates. And before you go today, we'd love to get your feedback about today's session um, to give us a sense of uh, how helpful it was or, you know, any feedback you have about this format. So we take a look at all the, all the responses and all the feedback um, in this Zoom poll. And then when you leave the Zoom meeting, you'll, you should see a, another short survey on your web browser that gives you a chance to answer some open-ended questions. So we appreciate and pay attention to any and all feedback. And we'll stay on for a few more moments in case anyone has questions, but once you fill out the feedback poll, you're welcome to move on with your day and we hope to see you again at a future core event. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone.